Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, viewers of all ages, good day to you and welcome back. I'm glad you guys are here. We are returning to the finalized part of this 2002 Pontiac Fiero with the 3.8 liter 3800 Series 2 GM V6 indestructible bulletproof little engine with the exception of the lower intake gasket set that we had to replace. That's the fatal flaw in these particular engines. Again, this is the part three. We've already done the tear down on part one. We did the assembly on part two, and now we are going to address all the knick-knacky little items like these spongy radiator hoses, this dirty belt tensioner and heater core bypass. We've got to get the air intake back on. We've got to plug in the fuel lines, get the ignition system reconnected, reinstall the alternator, and then drain all the coolant out of the oil pan. So since this is a part three and we're nearly complete, I'd like to go ahead and get through this as quickly as possible. So let's take this tensioner slash coolant bypass hose assembly conglomeration right here over to the parts washer. We'll get this thing cleaned up and nice and shiny looking. Then we'll get it back onto the vehicle. Powering up parts washer. Yeah. There's some value, you know. A little extra. Anyway, there's some blue silicone on there from the last guy. Somebody had uh, blue silicone. You know the only thing I like less than uh, orange silicone is blue silicone. I just don't like it. It stands out too much. It says, look at me. I've been resealed. The problem is, is the, the gray RTV and the black is a far superior quality product, but it does cost more, which is why folks choose the blue. And even the orange. Yeah, that's in there pretty good. It brings out the, the coolant passages in there because there was oil in the cooling system. And you've got one passage here that comes from the lower manifold. There's a little like plastic or a metal elbow. And then these two ports right here connect to the heater hoses to the heater core. Okay. Oh, darling, wife unit's here. She's on her way bye. out, though. You're here for your mandatory My video mandatory appearance. mandatory video Say appearance. Hi. Bye. Hi. Okay, bye. bye. See you later. Love you. Mandatory video appearance. Forcing her to be in my YouTube videos. <laughs> Dave's smiling. He's like, yeah, that guy really messed up by saying that. Ha! Ah. All right, back at the vehicle, and we have our heater core bypass hose manifold slash belt tensioner assembly here. Now, in order to connect the cooling system to the vehicle, we've got to employ the use of these little elbow businesses. Now, I know what you're going to say. These do exist in a semi-metallic type of configuration, and unfortunately, I had to go with the rubber ones, or the, the, the plastic ones, rather, this time around, because I was not able to acquire the metal ones. They are, for some reason, back ordered in my area and none of our parts people are showing a listing. So I've got to use the rubber ones, plastic ones. Uh, however, it should not be a problem. These things have a good 10, 12 years of life in them, uh, even though they are the plastic, not the rubber. But, um, you know, it was a, a decision out of necessity and I had to do what I had to do. So what we've got to do here, we plug in these uh, little bypass elbows. And those guys are designed to fit into that port and the water pump housing and into this port down here. So that hole back on the lower intake manifold. So we've got to get those in position, clocked properly, and then we'll take that whole assembly and push it into those ports. At that point, we can bolt it on and then we can stack the alternator on top of the tensioner. So that's the game plan here. I hope that made sense. It made sense to me. I just hope it made sense to you. So, we're gonna sit in this configuration, so what we need to do is kind of point these guys that way, make sure that they're somewhat parallel. Because this is not particularly simple to achieve here. We'll start with what we know, and that's the one we can see right there. And the one that's a little bit difficult is gonna be the plug under the manifold here that plugs oh there we go slipped right in we didn't see it but it, it went right in there that's why we put lubricant on these o-rings that way these things can shift and move around and rotate as we attempt to line this uh this tensioner up onto the engine block here and that's a flashlight okay two 15 mil fasteners i believe that one is for the alternator so we'll get that later alternator later so this one's gonna go in that hole there and this one down below it right here so what I'm gonna do since the alternator bolt passes through this and lines up with the threads in the cylinder head I'm gonna go ahead and install that bolt 
That way, I know that this bolt has maintained alignment with the threads. So if I tighten down this whole assembly here and these threads aren't aligned, I won't be fighting trying to get this bolt back in to mount the alternator. Hope that makes sense. All right, impact coming in. Let's just get these guys run down here. There we go. So now, you can easily pull the alternator bolt out with no alignment concerns. All right, time for the nader. Come on in here. So we'll start with, I guess, that big bottom bolt. Because we know that one goes in. And we know it's aligned. Get that guy in there. There we go. Now we'll get the little 10 mil over here in the corner. Get that one started. And then, of course, there's the one that goes around the back on the bracket to get that guy lined up next. So this is interesting. Look here. That bracket no longer lines up with the alternator. See that? Fortunately, this bracket is adjustable. So what we'll do is we'll take these two tens loose back here. And that should give me the flexibility here to move this piece of bracket so I can line up that fastener. This bracket bolts to the cylinder head similar to the bracket over there that bolts that ignition coil pack down to the cylinder head. Lots of bracketry. So what I wish to do here is run this bolt down all the way. I mean, not tight just yet, but I want to take all the slack out of it. So once that one is located, I'll tighten this one and this one back up. Then we'll tighten down this piece of the bracket here. Then we'll apply final torque to this, to this fastener that I'm working on right now. It's one of those uh, critical thinking moments you have to take into consideration when dealing with loosely fitting parts with uh, loose tolerances. Okay, 13 for that bottom bolt. The top unit is the 10 mil here. Slippage, but we're on nonetheless. That's good. Now, what I'll do is we'll go back over here to our wrench and we're going to tighten up these two tens on this bracket to secure that side of it to the cylinder head. We'll run these guys down. And there's that one out back. A little more. One more, a little more. There we go. Mm, click. Okay, that guy's good. So now, take our Nader power wire here. Fish that thing down through the hole. How'd I find it? No, it goes up top. It's gonna bolt on right there in the back. And of course, our plug goes right here. Now when we tighten this, you don't go full He-Man on the torque because you'll break the stud off inside of the alternator and ruin said alternator. All right, so the thread stopped and then give it a little bit more. That's all we need. We'll put this uh, little plastic rubber. Well, I keep getting rubber and plastic mixed up today. We'll slide this rubber thing back over that stud to protect it, in theory. Can't get it over there. That's tight. There we go, got it, beautiful. Okay, that wire's out of the way, we're good there. Um, oh, you know what? The next thing you guys are not gonna be particularly pleased about, these heater hoses, very difficult to locate right now. They're, they're out there but I've got to order them on eBay. So because of that, we're putting these hoses back where I found them and we can address these guys at a later date. These are uh, somewhat unobtainium, so they're going back on. 
I know that displeases some of you, but it just is what it is right now. We'll do it later, no, no worries. They're, they're, they're gonna seal, it's fine. Wiggle that guy in, O-rings are good. Let's lock her in here, however that works. Uh, how does that work? Oh, these just slip over, okay. Yeah, they just kind of slip on just to hang on to that little, uh, those little clips or whatever. That's fine. Okay, heater hoses are back together. Good. Let's travel back to the driver's side and get some of our other hoses connected. We have the two fuel lines right here. You can't get them backwards because they're two different sizes. We've got the EVAP system connector right here. And of course, the little, uh, little backup clips for the fuel lines. These are two different sizes, I think. That's our big one. It slips in and then just kind of clicks down over the line. There we go. Same thing with this side. Slip it in and then down over the line and that one came off. There we go. Good. Next up it is upper radiator hose replacement time. Like we saw earlier there's already a new thermostat in the housing. The upper hose is disconnected on the top side. Let's go ahead and disconnect it down here and then we'll slip this new hose, however that fits, like so. We'll slip the new hose in position and clamp it all down. Sure, our clamp is kind of pointing away from us and down so I'm going to go in with this cable clamp tool. It's basically a kind of set of pliers on a cable with this little mechanism right here. And that's designed to squeeze that clamp to release it. Go ahead and give it a squeeze. The clamp is now open and these are supposed to lock in. Uh, I don't trust those locks. Sometimes they lock in, sometimes they don't. And then sometimes they lock in and then slip right off when you're least expecting it, like right now. And that can hurt. So let's see, that's the hose, mock that up. This is gonna go on just like so. We'll slip this guy down into its new home here. Keep your fingers away from those clamps. They'll, they will get you. And once you've been gotten, they got you. And that's it, you lose. It hurts. Okay, lower section's on. The upper section's in position. So now, we'll take our clamp tool, release it, release the clamp, and that hose is in position. We'll do a similar procedure up here on the top of the hose. This clamp I can operate with just some regular hose clamp pliers. These are some snap-on ones. They've got a little groove machined in there to specifically manipulate constant pressure hose clamps. Which is why these are better than worm gear clamps because they can't work themselves loose. And again, they apply constant pressure around the circumference of the hose. There we go. It is at this point that the belt is ready to go back, so Let's get this thing routed. Let's see if I can't figure it out without a diagram. Smooth sides and grooved sides. Can't be too tough, right? Right, 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 right. Maybe, maybe not. I think it goes around the crank pulley, around the water pump, down over the compressor, up and over the nader, right up here. around that idler down there. I think we're getting it. Line up all the grooves here. And now I just need to figure out how that tensioner engages the belt. So let's, uh, let's check on this. Here, what I'm thinking, let's take the nader off. We'll slide this guy over that tensioner like so then I'll 
untension the tensioner. Back up and over the alternator. And then down below, gotta get this on the other side of that. I think that's, yeah, we got it. We're good here, perfect. Okay, let's take a look at our handiwork here. Give this back to me. Give it back. Stop there. Okay, so the belt is running around the nader, around the tensioner, around the idler, around the compressor, around the crank, water pump, and power steering. This is all looking good to my eyes. Let's get the intake on next. Okay, intake piping. That's gonna plug in right here to the throttle body. Let's get that guy set up and get on there. It just kind of fits with this piece of rubber. No clamp or anything on this section. It just sort of goes on there. We have an intake air temperature sensor connector. That guy goes right in hell. There's the sensor inside sticking out right there. Can't see. And then this guy I believe was zip tied just like over here somewhere. So we'll, we will re-zip tie that in a moment. Let's get the filter in the filter lid. That's next. Clamp click. Check that one too. Yeah, that one's loose. Okay, so what we have intakes on, air boxes on. I thought there was a wire. Yep, we have one wire dangling down here for the throttle body. I remembered that one. And then we have this other wire for this mass airflow that does not go through that little loop right there. It was in there. This one goes in there. There we go. All right, top side's looking good here. Ignition wires are on, coils are on, alternator's on, lower intake's resealed, plumbing is on, wires are connected, fuel line's connected. Everybody's connected, we're in good shape. Let's run this thing up in the air, grab the oil drain bucket, and get all that nasty contaminated, debris-filled oil mixed with coolant out of the oil pan. Moving on up, back to the subscribe button. Ah, we reveal all the drip shears. Look at that. That was nasty. Okay, I think we're good there. Set her down on the locks for some safety. Lock pickage, good. So now, I need to get this old lower radiator hose dug out of here. We'll plug the new one in. This is the new lower, not the new upper. Guess I can close up the radiator now. The drain is done draining. I ran out of flangy strength. Let us disconnect this little, uh, little bracket thing right here for these hoses. That's going to stay, and the hose is going to go. Get in there. Not designed to come apart. There we go. And then we have one clamp way up yonder. So this is nice. Look, there's the upper hose. There's the clamp, and look what they did. They're, the clamp is straddling this uh, transmission line. That's fun. Can't get normal tools in there to reach that, but I'm gonna try something kind of clever here. <laughs> Let's see if this works. I'll just go around it and uh, not try to avoid it. There we go. Sweet. There. Oh! Oh, I almost got me. Look. The hose slung down 
and it spilled a whole bunch of whatever coolant was left inside of it that was that almost really 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 got me well clean that up in a minute so here's our uh our new hose here let's get this kind of mocked up in position there we go so now we just need to slide that clamp over the end here and attach it to the radiator. So now let's try, that's how I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna reach around the hose, or the, the line rather. Get this guy all set up here. Slip it through the hose. And then the hose onto the radiator. I'm not sticking my fingers inside of this clamp either. That'll uh, that'll hurt. Cause one slip of the pliers, and you're gonna feel it. I'm already feeling it. This car is massive muscle fatigue. It's actually harder to work on than some of the modern stuff. Not gonna lie. Anyway, clamps on. There we go. Clamp is good. Hose is good. It's installed. Okay, let's pull the plug. Let's see what we get out of this drain pan. Come on. The friction is just low enough where you feel like you don't need the wrench, but just high enough where you can't do it by hand. Anyway, let's see what we get here. Letting it ride. Not too bad, most of it's oil. I'm not seeing what appeared to be the brake clean. Well, that was anticlimactic. I thought we were gonna find a bunch of garbage falling out of the bottom of this pan, coolant and whatnot. But it appears that's not the case in this particular case. We do have a bunch of spillage though running down the back of this engine. Rinse all that off while we're draining. Well, that didn't last long. Ah, look at this. This is interesting. We can see the separation of the new oil versus the old oil in this. Look. See when I hold the light behind it? That's the new oil that we dumped in. It also might be some of the brake clean, but you can see a clear separation between the two fluids. Let's hang back and let this thing drain for uh, for a few minutes. Then we'll come back in, refill the system, change the filter, and restart the engine. All righty, drain plug is back in. The oil's been draining out for uh, probably about a half an hour now. We took a little break. So let's go ahead and let her down, refill it. We're gonna go with some uh, superior quality Amsoil engine oil to lubricate this 3.8 liter. The filter's been changed. Once it's up and running, we're gonna go ahead and back it out. And I'm not going to install engine coolant just yet. We're gonna go to the garden hose, refill this system with some water. Once we get our outside and running, I'm gonna add a bottle of BG cooling system cleaner. And we're going to attempt to get all that oil sludge, whatever business, out of the cooling system. So real quick, I want to go ahead and take a moment to pay some attention to these uh, these strut brace bars that we see on a lot of engines. Now, I've let this vehicle down off the lift with this strut bar disconnected. I'm attempting to refit it back to the top of the struts and look at here, it does not want to go. Look at that, I can't get this thing to go down over those two studs. That was just not, it's not gonna happen. We can see it's pointed the right direction because there's witness marks on the strut tower from where the paint was rubbed off. So what I'm gonna do real quick is run this vehicle back up in the air, get the wheels off the ground, and we're gonna demonstrate just how much flex really occurs on the suspension, whether it's in the air or off the ground. And we're gonna show and prove out that these strut bars actually do perform a function. So we haven't done anything, haven't split the scene. And put this right here, watch this. Goes right in, no problem. 
And that will conclude this uh, off-tangent science experiment on suspension stabilization. Let's put these nuts back in. You know, I wasn't kidding at the end of that uh, second video on this car when I said there's a lot of knick-knacky items and detail work that had to go into the finalization of this project here. You can see there's a couple hours worth of, worth of work here. Pick. Spinach. Get on there. That one's in. Look at that, paint flew off. That sucks. Now, earlier I had said 5.30 oil, right? Look at here. Our cap says 10.30, right? But we're in Florida. And I can put 5.30 in here if I want to because it's a 30 weight oil, whether it's 5.30 or 10.30. And the first numeration followed by the W is the winter weight. And that is the cold oil performance rating meaning when this oil is below x amount of temperature it will behave as a five weight oil whereas a 1030 below a certain temperature will behave as a 10 weight oil although its nominal viscosity is a 30 weight oil and that will open a gigantic engine oil internet debate and everybody's gonna have a different opinion. But opinions are irrelevant because like I said, I can put 530 in this engine and that's what we're doing because we are not in Michigan or Ohio or Montana or New York or Maine or Vermont or Connecticut or Rhode Island or Maryland or Washington or Canada or the Arctic or the Antarctic. Let's see, uh, battery. We have to disconnect or reconnect our disconnected electron containment unit here. Eight millimeter. Get on there. Tighten, please. Get this guy set up. By the way, when doing things like this, make certain, certain words that your wrench doesn't reach the other post. Because if you connect the other post, with your wrench, it could hurt. That would be bad. My headlights are clicking. Okay, five sixteenths for this one because the eight does not fit. There we go. She's awake. She's alive, kinda. So we have engine oil, we have a filter, we have no coolant, we have electrons, and we have a sealed up new engine. Let's go hit the key and give this thing its first repair, restart, slash cold start. Okay, I'm gonna key it on a couple times to prime the fuel rail. Key on. Key off. Key on. Cranking. started she's running all right so far so good we have engine oil pressure no noises no leaks I don't hear anything abnormal down below we also have no leaks we go ahead and shut this thing down we'll check the oil level and then we'll back it out and fill the cooling system Let's see what that brand new oil looks like after 30 seconds of runtime. Looking good. I'm a tad overfilled. Look at that. Five quarts is a little much. I'm gonna have to drain that out. Yep, tad over. Oil's looking good. No debris floating around in it. Yeah, I need to give this thing a quick drain. Pull out about a half a quart zip tie this wire up and then we'll let her down all the way back it out and get this cooling system bg cleaner inside of the radiator all right let's just find out once and for all how effective some of these products can be so we're dumping in the cleaner solution we'll fill the radiator up with that first 
I'm gonna go ahead and back this out, fill it full of water, run it, and then service this cooling system. We'll re-drain it again, see what drained out of it, and then we can take a look and see exactly how much oil that stuff removed from the system. Now, it's not claimed, or they don't claim that it removes oil, that it's specifically for that, but we're gonna see what it does in a worst case scenario. Now, this is not a shill video, nor is it a paid advertisement. I'm simply experimenting with product that I use and sell at my shop. So if you don't like that, I don't know what to do for you. Um, not sponsored, this is how it is. Anyway, cooling system cleaners in there. There is no coolant. I did adjust the oil level. There's the bucket right over there with oil in it, if you want me to prove it. That's been done. I'm gonna back it out, refill this with water. We're gonna let it run. I'm gonna leave the funnel on there so it doesn't build pressure. That way it does not pre present a danger to me when I go to open the system back up because it will not be pressurized. We'll park her right about here, that's good. Parking's the auto. Let's grab the hose, fill this thing up, and rinse all the oil and nasty off of the engine. Hello, forklift. Another cool little feature about this funnel is if that cleaner does break up any oil, as it circulates through the system, it's naturally going to find its way into the funnel because this is the highest point in the fluid system. So this method, in fact, will help to actually extract those contaminants once they've been broken free from the inside surface. Because physics. See how we're doing here. A lot of bubbles and stuff. That's all the air purging out of it. So while we're here and before this heats up, I'm gonna go ahead and rinse off on the fingerprints and whatnot. We'll rinse off some of the oil off this engine. The belt's going to squeal since it's wet. It's gonna be fine. We'll rinse off the exhaust manifolds before they heat up. We'll rinse off everything. The undercarriage, the subframe, the radiator, we'll rinse the battery off, we'll rinse the intake off. You know what else is cool about doing this is if something is not right, like a spark plug wire has a hole in it or is leaking spark or uh, anything, the water will actually reveal that. For example, let's say I spray those hoses and the thing starts misfiring, I go, hey, those hoses don't like water very much. Something's wrong. And then I can take another look. Ooh, look at that. Oil's starting to bubble out. But we you can't do that. It's gonna ruin the engine and make the exhaust manifold crack the block and break the alternator. Ooh, ruin the paint. You know, that whole re thing actually stemmed from like one troll like two years ago. There was one guy, just one guy, and he said something just the wrong way. And I started making fun of him saying that his complaining and caring behavior sounded like re to me. That's all I heard was re. And I guess it sort of stuck. History of the re. It's history repeated. Ha <laughs> ha, bad joke of the day. We are starting to get some coolant flow here and there's a lot of oil starting to bubble up. 10 minutes later, let's give the hose a squeeze. It's pretty hot to the touch, but we're starting to get a lot of, a lot of, a lot of oil coming through. Oh, hot! Yeah, yeah. Thermostat has opened up, and now we've got some good coolant flow. There's a lot coming through that uh, that funnel there. Let's go check the thermal meter gauge here. We're right at 210. This is good. Yep, it's still coming. Still got a few bubbles here and there. The oil's getting nasty. 
Look at that. Yep, yeah, that's the old coolant. Still some oil coming through right there. Look at all that coming up out of the spout. Bubbling through. Nasty. Okay, let's go ahead. Now that we know this thing's up to temp, and I'm going to crack open the little bleeder on the thermostat housing and make sure there's no air trapped in the system. It should start. Oh, yeah, there's air in there. I hear it spraying out. You hear that? All right, let's crack this bleeder a little bit more open. We've got coolant coming out of it, or water rather. That's good. Temperature stable. We got loads and loads of oil out of the system. Uh, however, at this point, what I'm gonna have to do is gonna end up being a series of drain and refills uh, on this engine in order to uh, get all that nasty out of the system. Plus, it's all water. So I'm gonna drain all that out and then we're gonna go ahead and refill this uh, with the proper coolant mixture. So. As of right now, everything's piping hot, 210 degrees. We are not going to, we're not gonna drain the coolant right now. I'm gonna let this thing cool down. I'll probably do it in the morning when it's uh, at a very stable and low temperature. I don't wanna burn my flanges. So guys, having said all that, I have nothing more to offer you on this particular Firebird video at this time. Uh, all that's left is basically an oil change sticker and get some fresh coolant in there now that we have proved out we are capable of removing all of the contaminated debris so having said that as always I'd like to thank you guys for watching this video i hope you enjoyed this video or this particular series of videos let me know what you think about it in the comment section down below nothing kicks do not forget to tap that like button while you're down there and most importantly have yourselves a great day see you guys later in a video in a firebird end of no start PT Cruiser again in a transmission.